Is William Gaddis's first novel, The Recognitions, as difficult as Jonathan Franzen dubbed it in his 2002 essay for The New Yorker called Mr. Difficult? Not exactly. The Recognitions is, however, demanding, and in that sense, gratifying too. Gaddis clearly respects his reader's intelligence and patience. It's also exhausting. 40-plus page party scenes comprised solely of deliberately unattributed pseudo-intellectual conversational exchanges are tedious on a good day, soul and aestheticizing on a bad day. Gaddis demands that his readers sow time and effort in order to reap understanding and, perhaps, delight. And this isn't an unfair or unheard of reader-writer contract, as Franzen calls it in his essay. Why shouldn't literature and art in general be a collaborative effort between the creator and the consumer? Even a well-written children's book warrants rereadings as a reader's age and emotional and intellectual capacities ripen. But what exactly is the recognitions about? That's not such an easy question to answer. The novel is set predominantly in New York City, and the narrative takes place, again predominantly, in the 1950s. But from start to finish, an intimidating 956 pages, the novel makes use of a wide array of set pieces whose backdrops span the Americas, Europe, and Africa from the end of the First World War until the end of the Second. And the cast of characters is just as vast. A detailed analysis of the novel wouldn't be complete without ten or so in-depth character sketches, not to mention those peripheral characters whose presences serve to furnish the novel's many episodes. At the center of the narrative, however, is a disenchanted painter named Wyatt who accepts a Faustian bargain with an art dealer named Rectal Brown. Wyatt agrees to forge paintings in the style of 15th and 16th century Flemish artists, and Rectal Brown sells those paintings under the guise of recently discovered authentic works. Thus the novel's primary concern. What is authenticity and how much is it worth? Over the course of the novel, the reader observes Wyatt's dire search for authenticity. As far as Gaddis is concerned, however, New York City, and the Western world at large for that matter, hasn't got an authentic bone left in its body. So, when faced with the question, what is the recognitions about, a careful reader with limited time might reasonably respond, the recognitions is a meditation on authenticity in a time and a place where the currency of counterfeits and fakes has inflated and the cultural demand for authenticity has been replaced by a demand for insincerity, fraudulence, and imitations. Gaddis tackles this meditation on authenticity, certainly in a plethora of manners, but never more poignantly, I think, than through the explorations of art, faith, and the self. And for the sake of simplicity, I will be limiting my focus here to these three areas. The recognition's protagonist, Wyatt, is a painter. Thus, art is, at least ostensibly, at the center of Gaddis's concern when it comes to authenticity. However, Gaddis's indictment of artistic forgery isn't as straightforward as you might think. Early in the novel, and after an uninspired year spent in seminary, Wyatt decides to study painting in Munich. Realizing very quickly, however, that the world of art is stained by the presence of liars, cheaters, and con artists, he decides to give up his earnest and perhaps naive pursuit and move to New York City where he becomes a draftsman. Disillusioned by his experiences in the modern art scene, Wyatt remarks, That romantic disease, originality. All around we see originality of incompetent idiots. They could draw nothing, paint nothing, just so the mess they make is original. Even 200 years ago, who wanted to be original? To be original was to admit that you could not do a thing the right way, so you could only do it your own way. Shortly after saying this, and in a manner that feels divinely faded, Wyatt meets Rectal Brown and agrees to start forging paintings. Gaddis doesn't agree with his character Wyatt, though, does he? After all, it's clear that Wyatt's skepticism towards artistic originality is only a product of certain experiences to which he was unfortunately subjected. Furthermore, the recognitions is intended to be read as a condemnation of forgery, not an endorsement of it. But how then do we reconcile the recognitions as both a scathing criticism of unoriginality and a work that is itself indebted to so many of its literary predecessors? The novel is, after all, named after the Clementine recognitions, and any narrative similarities between the two should be considered deliberate. Furthermore, the recognition seems to be necessarily indebted to a whole host of mythological archetypes whose bindings include, but are certainly not limited to, Frazier's The Golden Bough and Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Not to mention the probably mammoth-sized list of allusions and cultural and literary references Gaddis makes use of throughout the novel, a seemingly exhaustive list of which can be found on williamgaddis.org. 
which begs the question, how much is Gaddis even concerned with his own originality and or forgery? After all, originality is a device that untalented people use to impress other untalented people to protect themselves from talented people. My feeling is that the seeming paradox that Gaddis's criticisms of unoriginality are housed within a book whose blueprint is hardly original is completely by design. He wants us, the reader, to subject the recognitions to the aesthetic quandaries he's deliberating within the text as a way of forcing us to engage with the questions he's asking. Additionally, he seems to be reminding us that true originality, whatever that may actually mean and entail, is impossible. Imitation can actually point towards reverence and appreciation, but learn the difference between inspiration and forgery. The result is an ironic display of metafictional awareness whose implementation helps the recognitions transcend its novel form. The aforementioned soul and aestheticizing dialogues between pseudo-intellectual partygoers is actually of some interest when considering Gaddis's indictment of inauthenticity. Gaddis is using these scenes to identify the proliferation of self-emptiness in the West by satirizing the vapid social exchanges that take place between characters who resemble, all too uncannily, himself and his readers. Of course, the fact that Gaddis's characters resemble modern readers as much as they did readers in 1955 is solely indicative of how timeless the quintessential person's struggle for identity and authenticity is. And the recognitions is totally relentless in its depiction of this self-emptiness. For example, one character wears a sling to support an unbroken arm in an attempt to generate charity and curiosity in his peers. Other characters say the same line over and over to different groups of people, the same way a stand-up comedian might try his jokes on small crowds to see which ones land. Further still, there are multiple instances where one character is mistaken by his or her peers for another character. Not even the characters in the book recognize their fellow characters. Similarly, Gaddis frequently describes his characters' stares as looking beyond one another instead of at one another. What are Gaddis' characters looking at? What are they looking for? And why can't anyone find it? Perhaps Gaddis is saying that no one is able to find what they're looking for because they're always looking beyond where it is. If his characters would just focus on what's in front of them, on their family and peers, and specifically themselves, for example, they might find something worth pursuing. Wyatt's struggle for identity is highlighted by the Faustian deal he makes with Rectal Brown. In the same way that Faust exchanges his eternal soul for worldly comforts, Wyatt exchanges his quest for identity and authenticity. After this exchange, and for the next 700 or so pages, the recognition's narrator only refers to Wyatt by general pronouns like him and he. Wyatt has lost, or given up, his identity. He regains it near the novel's close when he is given a new name, Stephen, the name of Christianity's first martyr, and this is after he has abandoned Rectal Brown and left New York City, once again in pursuit of his identity. And of course, Wyatt's struggle for identity is synonymous with his struggle for authenticity, insofar as a person can only be authentic when they are participating in the essence of who they are. The Clementine Recognitions is recognized as one of the first Christian writings, Gaddis is on record having stated that he set out to write the last. Gaddis is justified intolerance towards organized, puritanical Christian religiosity is on clear display in the recognitions. In fact, the novel spends a surprising amount of time with religion, religious themes, and religious, although not always pious, characters. For example, Wyatt's upbringing is set in a so-called Christian home, with a neglectful father and a puritanical aunt. Gaddis uses this set piece, and others like it, to leverage an attack on Christianity for being, among other things, spurious. But if Gaddis did in fact set out to indict Christianity with charges of fraudulence, inauthenticity, and hypocrisy, what are we to make of his reverence for the sincerely, unapologetically religious person? Specifically, what are we to make of Gaddis's literary treatment of Stanley, a devout Catholic in the recognitions? Gaddis seems to be sympathetic towards holy fools and the variety of Christian spirituality that attracts these so-called fools to begin with. Dostoevsky's The Idiot makes an appearance towards the end of the novel, and one can't help make comparisons between Mishkin and Stanley. And Gaddis's reverence doesn't begin or end with Stanley. Writing of a New York City drag show, he says, There was, in fact, a religious aura about this festival. Religious, that is, in the sense of devotion, adoration, celebration of deity, before religion became confused with the systems of ethics and morality, to become a sore affliction upon the very things it had once exalted. 
Speaking in a 1994 interview about the period in his life when he was writing the recognitions, Gaddis admits that he was intrigued, even if only out of self-centeredness, by the idea of ascetic Catholicism. Later on in that same interview, Gaddis recalls a friend's death in the family in this way. A woman who has worked for us for many years, and a true believer in the marvelous sense, her husband was killed in a uh, car accident, and uh, I went to the funeral, and um, everyone was so jubilant and talking about, the whole idea was that he's in a better place, and there was no uh, uh, kidding about it. I mean, this was very real. When someone asked his son, uh, uh, you know, your father was such a fine man, and how, uh, why would the Lord want to take him? Because the, um, uh, there are so many people here who just shouldn't be here, drunks, and uh, thieves and uh, all kinds of things. Uh, why would the Lord want to take a fine man like your father? And this boy said, well, the Lord, uh, he don't want to surround himself with a lot of drunks and thieves. He wants some good men around him. He wants some fine men like my father. And I thought, what a stunning thing to be able to embrace. I'm tempted to wonder, to what extent are Gaddis's criticisms of Christianity and the recognitions pointed specifically at its misuses? at the ways in which true Christianity has been counterfeited and then marketed as the real thing. One reviewer said that Gaddis's JR, which was published 20 years after The Recognitions, was one of the most brilliant and complex of recent comic novels, one that can be fairly compared to Catch-22 and Gravity's Rainbow. The irony here, of course, is that Catch-22 and Gravity's Rainbow are both positively indebted to Gaddis via the recognitions, which was largely ignored and unfairly, not to mention ineptly, criticized upon its release. In Fire the Bastards, synonymous author Jack Green points out that a number of critics assigned to the recognitions didn't finish or even start the book. One critic even copied sections of another critic's review for his own. How perfect, then, that in the closing chapters of The Recognitions, a literary critic who's been tasked with reviewing a tome, not unlike Gaddis's, confesses that he only needs the blurb on the book's dust jacket in order to be able to write his review. Which is to say, the very culture of fakeness that Gaddis set out to criticize in The Recognitions is the one that prevents and even ensures that his novel doesn't gain traction in the literary world. And Gaddis predicted it in said novel. And even though the recognitions most likely inspired works like Gravity's Rainbow and Catch-22, Gaddis's lineage of inspiration doesn't stop with just Pynchon or Heller. I've felt tremors of Gaddis's voice in McCarthy, Gass, Wallace, DeLillo, Vonnegut, and Franzen, to name a few. And if we take seriously the claim that the recognitions is the literary work that bridged the modernists and the postmodernists, we begin to recognize how important of an American artifact this novel really is. 